Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Bright on Buddhism. This week, we will be reading and discussing chapters 3 and 4 of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which is part of the Diga Nikaya of the Pali Canon. The title translates roughly to The Discourse on the Final Nirvana, and it documents the final days of Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha. Last time, we read and discussed chapters 1 and 2 of the Sutta, where the frame narrative about the war with the Vajis is set up, where the Buddha travels around preaching the Dharma, and where the Buddha becomes deathly ill but holds off his illness for a little longer. This week, in chapters 3 and 4, you will see the final sermon, the final meal, and the resurgent illness of Shakyamuni Buddha. We hope you enjoy. Then the Blessed One, getting ready in the forenoon, took bowl and robe and went into Vasali for alms. After the alms round and meal, on his return, he spoke to the Venerable Ananda, saying, Take up a mat, Ananda, and let us spend the day at the Kapala Shrine. So be it, Lord, Ananda replied. And the Venerable Ananda took up a mat and followed behind the Blessed One step by step. And the Blessed One went to the Kapala Shrine and sat down on the seat prepared for him. And when the Venerable Ananda had seated himself at one side, after he had respectfully saluted the Blessed One, the Lord said to him, Pleasant, Ananda, is Vasali. Pleasant are the shrines of Udena, Gotamaka, Satambaka, Bahuputta, Sarandada, and Kapala. And the Blessed One said, Whosoever Ananda has developed, practiced, employed, strengthened, maintained, scrutinized, and brought to perfection the four constituents of psychic power could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. The Tathagata, Ananda, has done so. Therefore the Tathagata could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. But the Venerable Ananda was unable to grasp the plain suggestion, the significant prompting given by the Blessed One. As though his mind was influenced by Mara, he did not beseech the Blessed One. May the Blessed One remain, O Lord. May the Happy One remain, O Lord, throughout the world period, for the welfare and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, well-being, and happiness of gods and men. And when for a second and a third time the Blessed One repeated his words, the Venerable Ananda remained silent. Then the Blessed One said to the Venerable Ananda, Go now, Ananda, and do as seems fit to you. Even so, O Lord, replied Ananda, and the Venerable Ananda, rising from his seat, respectfully saluted the Blessed One, and keeping his right side towards him, took his seat under a tree some distance away. And when the Venerable Ananda had gone away, Mara, the evil one, approached the Blessed One, and standing at one side, he spoke to the Blessed One, saying, Now, O Lord, let the Blessed One come to his final passing away. Let the Happy One utterly pass away. The time has come for the Perinibbana of the Lord. For the Blessed One, O Lord, spoke these words to me, I shall not come to my final passing away, evil one, until my bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, laymen and laywomen, have come to be true disciples, wise, well-disciplined, apt, and learned, preservers of the Dharma, living according to the Dharma, abiding by the appropriate conduct, and having heard the Master's word, are able to expound it, preach it, proclaim it, establish it, reveal it, explain it in detail, and make it clear, until... When adverse opinions arise, they shall be able to refute them thoroughly and well, and to preach this convincing and liberating dharma. And now, O Lord, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, laymen and laywomen, have become the Blessed One's disciples in just this way. So, O Lord, let the Blessed One come to his final passing away. The time has come for the Perinibbana of the Lord. For the Blessed One, O Lord, spoke these words to me. I shall not come to my final passing away, evil one, until this holy life taught by me has become successful, prosperous, far-renowned, popular, and widespread, until it is well proclaimed among gods and men. And this too has come to pass in just this way. So, O Lord, let the Blessed One come to his final passing away. Let the Happy One utterly pass away. The time has come for the Perinibbana of the Lord. When this was said, the Blessed One spoke to Mara, the evil one, saying, do not trouble yourself, evil one. Before long, the Perinibbana of the Tathagata will come about. Three months hence, the Tathagata will utterly pass away. And at the Kapala Shrine, the Blessed One, thus mindfully and clearly comprehending, renounced his will to live on. And upon the Lord's renouncing his will to live on, there came a tremendous earthquake, dreadful and astonishing, and thunder rolled across the heavens. And the Blessed One beheld it with understanding, and made this solemn utterance, what causes life, unbounded or confined? His process of becoming. This the sage renounces. With inward calm and joy, he breaks, as though a coat of mail, his own life's cause. Then it came to the mind of the venerable Ananda. Marvelous it is indeed, and most wonderful. 
the earth shakes mightily, tremendously. Dreadful and astonishing it is, how the thunders roll across the heavens. What could be the reason, what the cause, that so mighty an earthquake should arise? And the venerable Ananda approached the Blessed One, and respectfully greeting him, sat down at one side. Then he spoke to the Blessed One, saying, Marvelous it is indeed, and most wonderful. The earth shakes mightily, tremendously. Dreadful and astonishing it is, how the thunders roll across the heavens. What could be the reason, what the cause, that so mighty an earthquake should arise? Then the Blessed One said, There are eight reasons, Ananda, eight causes, for a mighty earthquake to rise. What are those eight? This great earth, Ananda, is established upon liquid, the liquid upon the atmosphere, and the atmosphere upon space. And when, Ananda, mighty atmospheric disturbances take place, the liquid is agitated. And with the agitation of the liquid, tremors of the earth arise. This is the first reason, the first cause for the arising of mighty earthquakes. Again, Ananda, when an ascetic or a holy man of great power, one who has gained mastery of his mind, or a deity who is mighty and potent, develops intense concentration on the delimited aspect of the earth element, and to a boundless degree on the liquid element, he too causes the earth to tremble, quiver, and shake. This is the second reason, the second cause, for the arising of mighty earthquakes. Again, Ananda, when the Bodhisattva departs from the Tusita realm and descends into his mother's womb, mindfully and clearly comprehending, and when a Bodhisattva comes out from his mother's womb, mindfully and clearly comprehending, and when the Tathagata becomes fully enlightened in unsurpassed supreme enlightenment, when the Tathagata sets rolling the excellent wheel of the Dharma, when the Tathagata renounces his will to live on, and when the Tathagata comes to pass away into the state of Nibbana in which no element of clinging remains, then too, Ananda, this great earth trembles, quivers, and shakes. These, Ananda, are the eight reasons, the eight causes, for a great earthquake to arise. Now, there are eight kinds of assemblies, Ananda, that is to say, assemblies of nobles, brahmins, householders, ascetics, of the four great kings, of the thirty-three gods, of maras, and of brahmas. And I recall, Ananda, how I have attended each of these eight kinds of assemblies, amounting to hundreds. And before seating myself and starting the conversation or the discussion, I made my appearance resemble theirs, my voice resemble theirs. And so I taught them the dharma, and roused, edified, and gladdened them. Yet while I was speaking to them thus, they did not know me, and they would inquire of one another, asking, Who is he that speaks to us? Is it a man or a god? Then having taught them the Dharma, and roused, edified, and gladdened them, I would straightway vanish. And when I had vanished too, they did not know me, and they would inquire of one another, asking, Who is he that has vanished? Is it a man or a god? And such, Ananda, are the eight kinds of assemblies. Now there are eight fields of mastery, Ananda. What are those eight? When one, perceiving forms subjectively, sees small forms, beautiful or ugly, external to himself, and mastering them, is aware that he perceives and knows them as they are. This is the first field of mastery. When one, perceiving forms subjectively, sees large forms, beautiful or ugly, external to himself, and mastering them, is aware that he perceives and knows them as they are. This is the second field of mastery. When one, not perceiving forms subjectively, sees small forms, beautiful or ugly, external to himself, and mastering them, is aware that he perceives and knows them as they are. This is the third field of mastery. When one, not perceiving forms subjectively, sees large forms, beautiful or ugly, external to himself, and mastering them, is aware that he perceives and knows them as they are. This is the fourth field of mastery. When one, not perceiving forms subjectively, sees forms external to himself that are blue, blue in color, of a blue luster, like the blossoms of flax, or like fine Benares muslin, which, burnished on both sides, is blue, blue in color, of a blue luster. When such a one sees forms external to himself that are blue and mastering them, is aware that he perceives and knows them as they are. This is the fifth field of mastery. When one, not perceiving forms subjectively, sees forms external to himself that are yellow, yellow in color, of a yellow luster, like the Kanikara blossom, or like fine Benares muslin, which, burnished on both sides, is yellow, yellow in color, of a yellow luster. When such a one sees forms external to himself that are yellow, and mastering them, is aware that he perceives them and knows them as they are. This is the sixth field of mastery. When one, not perceiving forms subjectively, sees forms external to himself that are red, red in color, of a red luster, like the Bandu Jivaka blossom, 
or fine Benares muslin, which, burnished on both sides, is red, red in color, of a red luster. When such a one sees forms external to himself that are red, and mastering them, is aware that he perceives them and knows them as they are. This is the seventh field of mastery. When one, not perceiving forms subjectively, sees forms external to himself that are white, white in color, of a white luster, like the morning star, or like fine Benares muslin, which burnished on both sides, is white, white in color, of a white luster. When such a one perceives forms external to himself that are white, and mastering them, is aware that he perceives them and knows them as they are. This is the eighth field of mastery. These, Ananda, are the eight fields of mastery. Now there are eight liberations, Ananda. What are those eight? One self having form, one perceives forms. This is the first liberation. Being unaware of one's own form, one perceives forms external to himself. This is the second liberation. Experiencing loveliness, one is intent upon it. This is the third liberation. By utterly transcending the perceptions of matter, by the disappearance of the perceptions of sense reaction, and by giving no attention to diversity perceptions, one becomes aware of, attains to, and abides in the sphere of infinite space. This is the fourth liberation. By utterly transcending the sphere of infinite space, one becomes aware of, attains to, and abides in the sphere of infinite consciousness. This is the fifth liberation. By utterly transcending the sphere of infinite consciousness, one becomes aware of, attains to, and abides in the sphere of nothingness. This is the sixth liberation. By utterly transcending the sphere of nothingness, one attains to and abides in the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. This is the seventh liberation. By utterly transcending the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, one attains to and abides in the cessation of perception and sensation. This is the eighth liberation. These, Ananda, are the eight liberations. There was a time, Ananda, when I dwelt at Uruvela, on the bank of the Naranjara River, at the foot of the goat herd's banyan tree soon after my supreme enlightenment. And Mara, the evil one, approached me, saying, Now, O Lord, let the blessed one come to his final passing away. Let the happy one utterly pass away. The time has come for the perinibbana of the Lord. Then, Ananda, I answered Mara, the evil one, saying, I shall not come to my final passing away, evil one, until my bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, laymen and laywomen, have come to be true disciples, wise, well-disciplined, apt and learned, preservers of the Dharma, living according to the Dharma, abiding by appropriate conduct, and, having learned the Master's word, are able to expound it, preach it, proclaim it, establish it, reveal it, explain it in detail, and make it clear, until, when adverse opinions arise, they shall be able to refute them thoroughly and well, and to preach this convincing and liberating Dharma. I shall not come to my final passing away, evil one, until this holy life taught by me has become successful, prosperous, far-renowned, popular, and widespread, until it is well proclaimed among gods and men. And again today, Ananda, at the Kapala shrine, Mara, the evil one, approached me, saying, Now, O Lord, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, laymen and laywomen, have come to be true disciples of the Blessed One, wise, well-disciplined, apt and learned, preservers of the Dharma, living according to the Dharma, abiding in the appropriate conduct, and having learned the Master's word are able to expound it, preach it, proclaim it, establish it, reveal it, explain it in detail, and make it clear. And when adverse opinions arise, they are now able to refute them thoroughly and well, and to preach this convincing and liberating Dharma. And now, O Lord, this holy life taught by the Blessed One has become successful, prosperous, far-renowned, popular, and widespread, and it is well proclaimed among gods and men. Therefore, O Lord, let the Blessed One come to his final passing away, let the happy one utterly pass away. The time has come for the perinibbana of the Lord. And then, Ananda, I answered Mara, the evil one, saying, Do not trouble yourself, evil one. Before long, the perinibbana of the Tathagata will come about. Three months hence, the Tathagata will utterly pass away. And in this way, Ananda, today at Kapala Shrine, the Tathagata has renounced his will to live on. At these words, the venerable Ananda spoke to the Blessed One, saying, May the Blessed One remain, O Lord. May the happy one remain, O Lord, throughout the world period, for the welfare and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, well-being, and happiness of gods and men. And the Blessed One answered, saying, Enough, Ananda. Do not entreat the Tathagata, for the time is past, Ananda, for such an entreaty. But for a second and a third time, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, 
May the blessed one remain, O Lord. May the happy one remain, O Lord, throughout the world period, for the welfare and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, well-being, and happiness of gods and men. Then the blessed one said, Do you have faith, Ananda, in the enlightenment of the Tathagata? And the venerable Ananda replied, Yes, O Lord, I do. Then how, Ananda, can you persist against the Tathagata, even up to the third time? Then the venerable Ananda said, This, O Lord, I have heard and learned from the Blessed One himself, when the Blessed One said to me, Whosoever, Ananda, has developed, practiced, employed, strengthened, maintained, scrutinized, and brought to perfection the four constituents of psychic power, could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. The Tathagata, Ananda, has done so. Therefore the Tathagata could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. And did you believe it, Ananda? said the Blessed One. Yes, O Lord, I did, replied Ananda. Then, Ananda, the fault is yours. Herein have you failed, inasmuch as you were unable to grasp the plain suggestion, the significant prompting given by the Tathagata, and you did not then entreat the Tathagata to remain. For if you had done so, Ananda, twice the Tathagata might have declined, but the third time he would have consented. Therefore, Ananda, the fault is yours. Herein you have failed. At Rajagriha, Ananda, when dwelling at Vulture's Peak, I spoke to you, saying, Pleasant, Ananda, is Rajagriha. Pleasant is Vulture's Peak. Whosoever, Ananda, has developed, practiced, employed, strengthened, maintained, scrutinized, and brought to perfection the four constituents of psychic power, could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. The Tathagata, Ananda, has done so. Therefore the Tathagata could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. So also at the Banyan Grove, at Robber's Cliff, at the Satapani Cave on the Vibara Mountain, at the Black Rock of Isagili, at the Serpent's Pool in the Cool Forest, at the Tapoda Grove, at the Bamboo Grove in the Squirrel's Feeding Ground, at Jivaka's Mango Grove, and at Small Nook in the Deer Park, I spoke to you in the same words, saying, Pleasant Ananda is Rajagriha, Pleasant are these places. Whosoever, Ananda, has developed, practiced, employed, strengthened, maintained, scrutinized, and brought to perfection the four constituents of psychic power, could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. The Tathagata, Ananda, has done so. Therefore the Tathagata could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. But you, Ananda, were unable to grasp the plain suggestion, the significant prompting given to you by the Tathagata, and you did not entreat the Tathagata to remain. For if you had done so, Ananda, twice the Tathagata might have declined, but the third time he would have consented. Therefore, Ananda, the fault is yours. Herein you have failed. So, also at Vasali, Ananda, at different times the Tathagata has spoken to you, saying, Pleasant, Ananda, is Vasali. Pleasant are the shrines of Udena, Gotamaka, Satambaka, Bahuputta, Sarandada, and Kapala. Whosoever, Ananda, has developed, practiced, employed, strengthened, maintained, scrutinized, and brought to perfection the four constituents of psychic power, could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. The Tathagata, Ananda, has done so. Therefore, the Tathagata could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. But you, Ananda, were unable to grasp the plain suggestion, the significant prompting, given you by the Tathagata, and you did not entreat the Tathagata to remain. For if you had done so, Ananda, twice the Tathagata might have declined, but the third time he would have consented. Therefore, Ananda, the fault is yours, herein you have failed. Yet, Ananda, have I not taught from the very beginning that with all that is dear and beloved there must be change, separation, and severance? Of that which is born, come into being, is compounded and subject to decay, how can one say, may it not come to dissolution? There can be no such state of things. And of that, Ananda, which the Tathagata has finished with, that which he has relinquished, given up, abandoned, and rejected, his will to live on, the Tathagata's word has been spoken once and for all. Before long, the Parinibbana of the Tathagata will come about. Three months hence, the Tathagata will utterly pass away. And that the Tathagata should withdraw his words for the sake of living on, this is an impossibility. So then, Ananda, let us go to the hall of the gabled house in the great forest. And the Venerable Ananda replied, So be it, Lord. Then the Blessed One, with the Venerable Ananda, went to the hall of the gabled house in the great forest. And there he spoke to the Venerable Ananda, saying, 
Go now, Ananda, and assemble in the hall of audience all the bhikkhus who dwell in the neighborhood of Vasali. So be it, Lord, Ananda replied. And the venerable Ananda gathered all the bhikkhus who dwelt in the neighborhood of Vasali, and assembled them in the hall of audience. And then, respectfully saluting the Blessed One, and standing at one side, he said, The community of bhikkhus is assembled, Lord. Now let the Blessed One do as he wishes. Thereupon the Blessed One entered the hall of audience, and, taking a seat prepared for him, he exhorted the bhikkhus, saying, Now, O bhikkhus, I say to you that these teachings of which I have direct knowledge, and which I have made known to you, these you should thoroughly learn, cultivate, develop, and frequently practice, that the life of purity may be established and may long endure, for the welfare and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, well-being, and happiness of gods and men. And what, bhikkhus, are these teachings? They are the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right efforts, the four constituents of psychic power, the five faculties, the five powers, the seven factors of enlightenment, and the noble eightfold path. These, bhikkhus, are the teachings of which I have direct knowledge, which I have made known to you, and which you should thoroughly learn, cultivate, develop, and frequently practice, that the life of purity may be established and may long endure, for the welfare and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, well-being, and happiness of gods and men. Then the Blessed One said to the bhikkhus, So, bhikkhus, I exhort you, all compounded things are subject to vanish. Strive with earnestness. The time of the Tathagata's Parinibbana is near. Three months hence the Tathagata will utterly pass away. And having spoken these words, the Happy One, the Master, spoke again, saying, My years are now full ripe. The lifespan left is short. Departing, I go hence from you, relying on myself alone. Be earnest, then, O bhikkhus, be mindful and of virtue pure. With firm resolve guard your own mind. Whoso untiringly pursues the dharma and the discipline shall go beyond the round of births and make an end of suffering. Then the Blessed One, getting ready in the forenoon, took bowl and robe and went into Vasali for alms. After the alms round and meal, on his return, he looked upon Vasali with the elephant's look, and said to the venerable Ananda, This, Ananda, is the last time that the Tathagata will look upon Vasali. Come, Ananda, let us go to Bandagama. So be it, Lord, replied Ananda. And the Blessed One took up his abode at Bandagama, together with a large community of bhikkhus. And the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus, saying, Bhikkhus, it is through not realizing, through not penetrating four principles that this long course of birth and death has been passed through and undergone by me as well as by you. What are those four? They are noble virtue, noble concentration, noble wisdom, and noble emancipation. But now, bhikkhus, that these have been realized and penetrated, cut off is the craving for existence. Destroyed is that which leads to renewed becoming, and there is no fresh becoming. And having spoken these words, the happy one, the master, spoke again, saying, Virtue, concentration, wisdom, and emancipation unsurpassed. These are the principles realized by Gotama the renowned. And knowing them, he, the Buddha, to his monks has taught the Dharma. He, the destroyer of suffering, the master, the seer, is at peace. And also at Bandagama, the blessed one often gave counsel to the bhikkhus thus, Such and such is virtue, such and such is concentration, and such and such is wisdom. Great becomes the fruit, great is the gain of concentration, when it is fully developed by virtuous conduct. Great becomes the fruit, great is the gain of wisdom, when it is fully developed by concentration. Utterly freed from the taints of lust, becoming, and ignorance is the mind that is fully developed by wisdom. When the Blessed One had stayed at Bandagama as long as he pleased, he spoke to the Venerable Ananda, Come Ananda, let us go to Hatigama. So be it, Lord, Ananda replied. And the Blessed One took up his abode at Hatigama together with a large community of bhikkhus. And when the Blessed One had stayed at Hatigama as long as he pleased, he took up his abode at Ambagama, then at Jambugama. And at each of these places the Blessed One often gave counsel to the bhikkhus thus, Such and such is virtue, such and such is concentration, and such and such is wisdom. Great becomes the fruit, great is the gain of concentration when it is fully developed by virtuous conduct. Great becomes the fruit, Great is the gain of wisdom when it is fully developed by concentration. Utterly freed from the taints of lust, becoming, and ignorance is the mind that is fully developed by wisdom. And when the Blessed One had stayed at Jambugama as long as he pleased, he spoke to the Venerable Ananda. Come, Ananda, let us go to Boganagara. So be it, Lord, replied Ananda. And the Blessed One took up his abode at Boganagara, together with a large community of bhikkhus, and stayed in the Ananda Shrine. And there the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus, saying, 
Now, Bikus, I shall make known to you the four great references. Listen and pay heed to my words. And those Bikus answered, saying, So be it, Lord. Then the Blessed One said, In this fashion, Bikus, a Biku might speak. Face to face with the Blessed One, brethren, I have heard and learned thus. This is the Dharma and the discipline, the Master's dispensation. Or, in an abode with such and such a name, lives a community with elders and a chief. Face to face with that community, I have heard and learned thus. This is the Dharma and the discipline, the Master's dispensation. Or, in an abode of such and such a name lives a single bhikkhu who is an elder, who is learned, who has accomplished his course, who is a preserver of the Dharma, the discipline, and the summaries. Face to face with that elder, I have heard and learned thus. This is the Dharma and the discipline, the Master's dispensation. In such a case, bhikkhus, the declaration of such a bhikkhu is neither to be received with approval nor with scorn. Without approval and without scorn, but carefully studying the sentences word by word, one should trace them in the discourses and verify them by the discipline. If they are neither traceable in the discourses nor verifiable by the discipline, one must conclude thus. Certainly, this is not the Blessed One's utterance. This has been misunderstood by that bhikkhu, or by that community, or by those elders, or by that elder. In that way, bhikkhus, you should reject it. But if the sentences concerned are traceable in the discourses and verifiable by the discipline, then one must conclude thus. Certainly, this is the Blessed One's utterance. This has been well understood by that bhikkhu, or by that community, or by those elders, or by that elder. And in that way, bhikkhus, you may accept it on the first, second, third, or fourth reference. These bhikkhus are the four great references for you to preserve. And also at Boganagara, at the Ananda Shrine, the Blessed One gave counsel to the bhikkhus thus, Such and such is virtue, such and such is concentration, and such and such is wisdom. Great becomes the fruit, great is the gain of concentration, when it is fully developed by virtuous conduct. Great becomes the fruit, great is the gain of wisdom, when it is fully developed by concentration. Utterly freed from the taints of lust, becoming, and ignorance, is the mind that is fully developed in wisdom. When the Blessed One had stayed at Boganagara as long as he pleased, he spoke to the Venerable Ananda, saying, Come, Ananda, let us go to Pava. So be it, Lord, replied Ananda. And the Blessed One took up his abode at Pava with a great community of bhikkhus, and stayed in the mango grove of Chunda, who was by family a metal worker. And Chunda, the metal worker, came to know, The Blessed One, they say, has arrived at Pava and is staying in my mango grove. And he went to the Blessed One, and having respectfully greeted him, sat down at one side. And the Blessed One instructed Chunda, the metal worker, in the Dharma, and roused, edified, and gladdened him. Then Chunda spoke to the Blessed One, saying, May the Blessed One, O Lord, please accept my invitation for tomorrow's meal, together with the community of bhikkhus. And by his silence the Blessed One consented. Sure then of the Blessed One's consent, Chunda the metal worker rose from his seat, respectfully saluted the Blessed One, and keeping his right side toward him, took his departure. And Chunda the metal worker, after the night had passed, had choice food, hard and soft, prepared in his abode, together with a quantity of Sukara Madhava, and announced it to the Blessed One, saying, It is time, O Lord, the meal is ready. Thereupon the Blessed One, in the forenoon, having got ready, took bowl and robe, and went with the community of bhikkhus to the house of Chunda, and there sat down on the seat prepared for him. And he spoke to Chunda, saying, With the Sukara Madhava you have prepared, Chunda, you may serve me. With the other food, hard and soft, you may serve the community of bhikkhus. So be it, Lord, replied Chunda. And with the Sukara Madhava prepared by him, he served the Blessed One. And with the other food, hard and soft, he served the community of bhikkhus. Thereafter the Blessed One spoke to Chunda, saying, Whatever Chunda is left over of the Sukara Madhava, bury that in a pit. For I do not see in all this world, with its gods, maras, and brahmas, among the host of ascetics and brahmins, gods and men, anyone who could eat it and entirely digest it, except the Tathagata alone. And Chunda the metal worker answered the Blessed One, saying, So be it, O Lord. And what remained over of the Sukara Madhava he buried in a pit. Then he returned to the Blessed One, respectfully greeted him, and sat down at one side, and the Blessed One instructed Chunda the metal worker in the Dharma, and roused, edified, and gladdened him. After this he rose from his seat and departed. And soon after the Blessed One had eaten the meal provided by Chunda the metal worker, a dire sickness fell upon him, even dysentery, and he suffered sharp and deadly pains. And the Blessed One endured them mindfully, clearly comprehending and unperturbed. Then the Blessed One spoke to the Venerable Ananda, saying, Come, Ananda, let us go to Kushinara. And the Venerable Ananda answered, So be it, Lord. When he had eaten Chunda's food, I heard, with fortitude, the deadly pains he bore. From the Sukara Madhava, a sore and dreadful sickness came upon the Lord. 
but nature's pangs he endured. Come, let us go to Kushinara, was his dauntless word. Now on the way, the Blessed One went aside from the highway and stopped at the foot of a tree. And he said to the venerable Ananda, Please fold my upper robe in four, Ananda, and lay it down. I am weary and want to rest a while. So be it, Lord. And the venerable Ananda folded the robe in four and laid it down. And the Blessed One sat down on the seat prepared for him and said to the venerable Ananda, Please bring me some water, Ananda. I am thirsty and want to drink. And the venerable Ananda answered the Blessed One, But just now, Lord, a great number of carts, five hundred carts, have passed over, and the shallow water has been cut through by the wheels, so that it flows turbid and muddy. But the Kakuta River, Lord, is close by, and its waters are clear, pleasant, cool, and translucent. It is easily approachable and delightfully placed. There the Blessed One can quench his thirst and refresh his limbs. But a second time the Blessed One made his request, and the Venerable Ananda answered him as before. And then a third time the Blessed One said, Please bring me some water, Ananda. I am thirsty and want to drink. Then the Venerable Ananda answered, saying, So be it, Lord. And he took the bowl and went to the stream. And the shallow water, which had been cut through by the wheels so that it flowed turbid and muddy, became clear and settled down, pure and pleasant, as the Venerable Ananda drew near. Then the Venerable Ananda thought, Marvelous and most wonderful indeed is the power and glory of the Tathagata. And he took up water in the bowl and carried it to the Blessed One, and said, Marvelous and most wonderful indeed is the power and glory of the Tathagata. For this shallow water, which had been cut through by the wheels so that it flowed turbid and muddy, became clear and settled down, pure and pleasant as I drew near. Now let the Blessed One drink the water, let the Happy One drink, and the Blessed One drank the water. Now it so happened that one Pukusa of the Mala clan, who was a disciple of Alara Kalama, was passing by on his way from Kushinara to Pava. And when he saw the Blessed One seated at the foot of a tree, he approached him, respectfully greeted him, and sat down at one side. And he spoke to the Blessed One, saying, Marvelous it is, Lord, most wonderful it is, O Lord, the state of calmness wherein abide those who have gone forth from the world. For at one time, Lord, Alara Kalama was on a journey, and he went aside from the highway and sat down by the wayside at the foot of a tree to pass the heat of the day. And it came about, Lord, that a great number of carts, even five hundred carts, passed by him, one by one. And then, Lord, a certain man who was following behind that train of carts approached and spoke to him, saying, Did you, sir, see a great number of carts that passed you by? And Alara Kalama answered him, I did not see them, brother. The man replied, But the noise, sir, surely you heard. Alara Kalama responded, I did not hear it, brother. Then that man asked him, Then, sir, perhaps you slept? Alara Kalama said, No, brother, I was not sleeping. The man said, Then, sir, were you conscious? Alara Kalama said, I was, brother. Then that man said, Then, sir, while conscious and awake, you still did not see the great number of carts, even five hundred carts, that passed you by one after the other, nor heard the noise. Why, sir, your very robe is covered with their dust. And Alara Kalama replied, saying, So it is, brother. And to that man, O Lord, came the thought, Marvelous it is, most wonderful indeed it is, the state of calmness wherein abide those who have gone forth from the world. And there arose in him a great faith in Alara Kalama, and he went his way. Now what do you think, Pukusa? What is more difficult to do, more difficult to meet with, that a man, while conscious and awake, should not see a great number of carts, even five hundred carts, that passed him by one after the other, nor hear the noise, or that one, conscious and awake, in the midst of a heavy rain, with thunder rolling, lightning flashing, and thunderbolts crashing, should neither see it nor hear the noise? What, O Lord, are five hundred carts, nay six, seven, eight, nine hundred, or a thousand, or even hundreds of thousands of carts, compared with this? Now one time, Pukusa, I was staying at Atuma, and I had my abode in a barn there. And at that time there was a heavy rain, with thunder rolling, lightning flashing, and thunderbolts crashing. And two farmers who were brothers were killed close to the barn, together with four oxen, and a great crowd came forth from Atuma to the spot where they were killed. Now at that time, Pukusa, I had come out of the barn and was walking up and down in thought before the door. And a certain man from the great crowd approached me, respectfully greeted me, and stood at one side. And I asked him, Why, brother, has this great crowd gathered together? And he answered me, Just now, Lord, there was a heavy rain, with a thunder rolling, lightning flashing, and thunderbolts crashing, and two farmers who were brothers were killed close by, together with four oxen. It is because of this that the great crowd has gathered. But where, Lord, were you? I was here, brother. The man replied, Yet, Lord, did you not see it? I did not see it, brother. But the noise, Lord, you surely heard. 
I did not hear it, brother. Then that man asked me, Then, Lord, perhaps you slept? No, brother, I was not sleeping. Then, Lord, you were conscious? I was, brother. Then that man said, Then, Lord, while conscious and awake, in the midst of a heavy rain, with thunder rolling, lightning flashing, and thunderbolts crashing, you neither saw it nor heard the noise? And I answered him, saying, I did not, brother. And to that man, Pukusa, came the thought, Marvelous it is, most wonderful indeed it is, the state of calmness wherein abide those who have gone forth from the world. And there arose in him a great faith in me, and he respectfully saluted me, and keeping his right side towards me, he went his way. When this had been said, Pukusa of the Mala clan said to the Blessed One, The faith, Lord, that I had in Alara Kalama, I now scatter to the mighty wind. I let it be carried away as by a flowing stream. Excellent, O Lord, most excellent, O Lord. It is as if, Lord, one were to set upright what had been overthrown, or to reveal what had been hidden, or to show the path to one who had gone astray, or to light a lamp in the darkness, so that those having eyes might see. Even so has the Blessed One set forth the Dharma in many ways. And so, Lord, I take my refuge in the Blessed One, the Dharma, and the community of bhikkhus. May the Blessed One accept me as his disciple, one who has taken refuge until the end of life. Then Pukusa of the Mala clan spoke to a certain man, saying, Bring me at once, friend, two sets of golden-hued robes, burnished and ready for wear. And the man answered him, So be it, sir. And when the robes were brought, Pukusa of the Mala clan offered them to the Blessed One, saying, May the Blessed One, O Lord, out of compassion, accept this robe from me. And the Blessed One said, Robe me then in one Pukusa, and in the other robe, Ananda. So be it, Lord, replied Pukusa. And he thereupon robed the Blessed One in one, and in the other he robed the Venerable Ananda. And the Blessed One instructed Pakusa of the Mala clan in the Dharma, and roused, edified, and gladdened him. After that, Pakusa of the Mala clan rose from his seat, respectfully saluted the Blessed One, and keeping his right side towards him, went his way. And soon after Pakusa of the Mala clan had departed, the Venerable Ananda arranged the set of golden-hued robes, burnished and ready for wear, about the body of the Blessed One. But when the set of robes was arranged upon the body of the Blessed One, it became as though faded, and its splendor dimmed. And the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Marvelous it is, O Lord, most wonderful indeed it is, how clear and radiant the skin of the Tathagata appears. This set of golden-hued robes, burnished and ready for wear, Lord, now that it is arranged upon the body of the Blessed One, seems to have become faded, its splendor dimmed. It is so, Ananda. There are two occasions, Ananda, when the skin of the Tathagata appears exceedingly clear and radiant. Which are these two? The night, Ananda, when the Tathagata becomes fully enlightened in unsurpassed supreme enlightenment and the night when the Tathagata comes to his final passing away into the state of nirvana in which no element of clinging remains. These, Ananda, are the two occasions on which the skin of the Tathagata appears exceedingly clear and radiant. And now today, in the last watch of this very night, Ananda, in the Mala's Sala Grove, in the vicinity of Kushinara, between two Sala trees, the Tathagata will come to his Parinibbana. So now, Ananda, let us go to the Kakuta River. Clad in Pakusa's gift, the robes of gold, the master's form was radiant to behold. Then the Blessed One went to the Kakuta River together with a great community of bhikkhus. And he went down into the water and bathed and drank. And coming forth from the water again, he went to the mango grove, and there he spoke to the venerable Chundaka, saying, Please fold my upper robe in four, Chundaka, and lay it down. I am weary and would rest a while. So be it, Lord. And Chundaka folded the robe in four and laid it down. And the Blessed One lay down on his right side, in the lion's posture, resting one foot upon the other, and so disposed himself, mindfully and clearly comprehending, with the time for rising held in mind. And the venerable Chundaka sat down in front of the Blessed One. The Buddha to Kakuta's river came, where cool and limpid flows the pleasant stream, where washed in water clear his weary frame, the Buddha, he in all the world supreme, and having bathed and drank, the teacher straight crossed over, the bhikkhus thronging in his wake, discoursing holy truths the master great toward the mango grove his path did take there to the elder chundaka he spoke lay down my robe please folded into four then the elder swift as a lightning stroke hastened the teacher's bidding to obey weary the lord then lay down on the mat and chunda on the ground before him sat then the blessed one spoke to the venerable ananda saying it may come to pass ananda that someone will cause remorse to chunda the metal worker saying, It is no gain to you, friend Chunda, but a loss, that it was from you the Tathagata took his last alms mule, and then came to his end. 
Then, Ananda, the remorse of Chunda should be dispelled after this manner. It is a gain to you, friend Chunda, a blessing that the Tathagata took his last alms meal from you, and then came to his end. For, friend, face to face with the Blessed One, I have heard and learned. There are two offerings of food, which are of equal fruition, of equal outcome, exceeding in grandeur the fruition and result of any other offerings of food. Which two? The one partaken of by the Tathagata before becoming fully enlightened in unsurpassed supreme enlightenment, and the one partaken of by the Tathagata before passing into the state of Nibbana in which no element of clinging remains. By his deed, the worthy Chunda has accumulated merit which makes for long life, beauty, well-being, glory, heavenly rebirth, and sovereignty. Thus, Ananda, the remorse of Chunda, the metalworker, should be dispelled. Then the Blessed One, understanding that matter, breathed forth a solemn utterance. Who gives, his virtues shall increase. Who is self-curbed, no hatred bears. Whoso is skilled in virtue, evil shuns. And by the rooting out of lust and hate, and all delusion, comes to be at peace. That was part two of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, including chapters three and four. So, Docs, what did you think? This one didn't have that much happening in it, except the like the big thing here was relinquishing the will to live. Yeah. That phrase has a strong pull to it. Like, I really, that's an interesting way to put it. And it's, I think, healthy that this religion puts such an emphasis on, hey, you're going to die, and at some point that's okay. Exactly, yeah. And it's also part of the doctrine that enlightened beings have control over when and how and in what circumstances they die. Because they're omniscient, because they have their enlightenment, and because they have you know, a full view of the karmic trajectory of all sentient beings, including themselves, they can say to themselves, okay, you know, it's going to happen now. I've kind of decided. And in that regard, you know, they go out on their own terms and this will be used in the future in other schools of Buddhism, especially as this becomes adapted into the Mahayana version, the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra they will start to say he chose that specific time to pass away and those specific circumstances to pass away as a teaching tool, as a way of educating, as a way of enlightening beings. And I see strands of that in other aspects of the religion that I've seen, such as like there are, you know, the we've done an episode on self-immolation. So that's part right. of it as well. And like, I've also like, there's that one sect that, has uh the like self-preserved mummification right that right like those folks like the my understanding of the lore there is that uh the monk in question is not dead they are just in a state of meditation in that so but, but i see like this is obviously a really important doctrine that i that i see spiraling into other parts of the religion Absolutely. And this is such a transformative sutra in regards to obviously being one of the most important events in the trajectory of early Buddhism, the death of Shakyamuni Buddha. But it's also where a lot of the doctrine dealing with death really comes out. And this is where the establishment of a lot of death rituals and memorial rituals and funerary rituals come out. That'll come out more in the next part that we release where we read and discuss chapters five and six, but obviously in, you know, part three and four, this is where, like you say, he relinquishes his will to live and we start to see how he does that and in what context he does that. And we start to see how he is functioning because this is really like the dead center of the sutra. There's half of it left almost whenever he relinquishes his will to live. And so for that whole second half, he's alive and he's preaching and he's sort of dealing with the backlash, dealing with the ripples that him relinquishing his will to live causes among the community. And there's a lot of them. It really emphasizes at multiple points in the sutta that this is like the two points where he is most radiant, his skin is most radiant, is when he achieves enlightenment and when he 
achieves final nirvana. So it's putting up the the two most important things this guy did achieve enlightenment and then die. Like those are his two high points. Uh, like the way the points where he is uh most empowered, I guess, would be the way to put it. I'm not sure what the right term would be, but like it's obviously putting a lot of emphasis on how important it is that he does this. Absolutely. And this is the natural conclusion of this linear trajectory that certainly Mahayana tries to argue exists. Theravada might have something to say about it, but there's this linear trajectory that is presented and projected that we've talked about between being a regular layperson and then being an arhat and then being a bodhisattva, a pratyeka Buddha, and a fully realized Buddha. And of course, beyond that is just nirvana. After fully realized Buddhahood, there's nothing else. It's nirvana. And you can see that he's hit those important stages. Like maybe you could see his enlightenment as being the beginning of his arhatship with a certain reading. This reading is not used by many Mahayana scholars, but is definitely a reading that can be given to this, this sort of trajectory. He achieves his enlightenment for the first time. And then he slowly kind of, over the course of the life that he lives preaching the Dharma, his community and he also kind of break through other levels of higher enlightenment. And then, you know, this is his fully realized Buddhahood is when he's preaching this. And then after this, he's dead. He's passed away. He's gone into nirvana without any, without any remainder. You know, this reading is not widely held in East Asia because they start to say that his fully realized Buddhahood was actually long before he was even born in this world. And that all of this was like a skillful means and was all of this was the last step in his teaching before he passes away into perfect final nirvana without any remainder. But if you look at it from a more cynical point of view or even a more literal point of view, when you look at when which sutras came when and so on in the Buddha's life allegedly, you can maybe make an argument that his first enlightenment was actually only the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And then by the time we have this text, we start to see maybe not the most refined, but some of the things that he's saying after he has achieved his most refined teachings. So going into the texts directly, so first of all, we have Mara's appeal. This I'm interested to hear more about how Mara works in the religion as a whole, because this seems taunting. Yes. Mara is like, ha ha, you're about to go away. And it's like, why? What? That's a good thing. I don't understand what the taunt is. So one of the taunts that's going on here is that Mara wants him to die at a certain time when it's easy from a desirous point of view and when the sangha and the dharma have not been really completed and perfected so he's saying to the buddha early in this part early in the section that we're reading and discussing he says go ahead and die because mara knows that the buddha knows that the the sangha is not completely ready they're not well learned enough to do without him and he also knows that Mara knows that the Buddha has already started to feel sick. He knows that the Buddha is hurting and that he has been taken over by immense stomach pains and has a lot of difficulty traveling and moving around and all that stuff. And the Buddha is enduring this with mindfulness and with grace as, as he always does throughout this text. But Mara is trying to say, because it's an opportune moment, he's trying to say, die sooner because it's easier. I'm the god of desire, and I want you to give in to this desire, and die sooner, because then the community will not be fully complete. They won't have their capstone, if you might say that the doctrines of death and funerary rituals and the organization of the, of the disciples such that they can sustain themselves after his death, none of that's completed and none of that's ready. So the Buddha is rejecting him by saying, no, the Sangha still needs me. They need the skill to preach the Dharma, to defend the Dharma, and to spread the Dharma. And 
you know, they're close, but they don't have it yet. So I'm not going to yet. Interesting. I guess I am having a hard time as I reading this telling who is actually speaking. Because when I read it, it was like, it looked like Mara, as like how I parsed these sentences was Mara saying, hey, your work is done. You can go now. And yeah, mm -hmm. like I'm not sh like I'm not sure if Mara is speaking or the Buddha is speaking some of these words, and knowing that completely changes what's what's actually being communicated, because it looks to me like Mara is saying, "Hey, you're done. You can. You're good to go now." Yeah, he is. He is saying that, but you just said he isn't saying that. Well, that's the double speak, right? So Mara knows that the song is not ready for it, but Mara is trying to sugarcoat it and sell it. He's trying to give a sales pitch to the Buddha to say, "Yeah, go ahead and die. You're all you're all set." While they both okay. know that the song is not all set. This is something that's very interesting about Mara in the early texts is that he doesn't really fit your typical Judeo-Christian Satan or devil figure. Even right. though he's kind of cast in that archetype for us Westerners, he is very, very nice to the Buddha. And he's very, very reverent. And he's very, very good in how he talks. He's very polite. He says all these nice and sweet things. But it's because he's trying to be a used car salesman. You know, he's gotcha. trying to tempt the Buddha. He is temptation and desire. And so he's not ever going to say, like, I need you to die sooner because I hate you. He's not going to say, I need you to. He's going to say, I think that your work is done. You've done so much in this long life of yours. You've preached the Dharma so well. You have effectively defeated me. Everything's all good. I am completely laid down and I have been converted. I'm in your victory right now. And the Buddha is saying to himself and to Mara, well, no, I know that you're trying to get me to go before my time. I'm actually going to stick around for a while because they need to be protected against people like you. They need to know how to protect themselves against people and beings like you. <laughs> okay, I yeah, that's something that I guess we needed I would have needed more context to really grasp because I wasn't I'm not right. We haven't talked about Mara enough for me to understand how to read his dialogue yet. So that's something we'll have to come to later. In another episode, like I want to know more about Mara just so I can understand how to read this kind of text. Absolutely. Mara will definitely be able to take up an entire regular episode because he is he's such a trickster. He's a very fun and interesting character in the text when you read them like a narrative or like a story. Because, you know, like I said, he's always got these ulterior motives and you never really know what what he's trying to do, so to speak. You know, he's he's like a, a mysterious trickster character who he, he's kind of shifty and shady and you don't know what he wants or what he's going to do to get it. Cool. OK, so that makes Mara's appeal make a lot more sense to me now. So after that, uh, relinquishes his will to live and that causes like earthquakes and natural disasters all over the place. Yeah, yeah. So he relinquishes his will to live and Ananda sees all these natural disasters that happen and he asks the buddha what are the causes of natural disasters like this and one of them ends up being a perfectly enlightened one relinquishing their will to live this is sort of another thing that's unique to buddhist texts compared to the western religious corpus is that whenever the buddha does stuff says stuff becomes stuff the world sort of reacts to it all of nature reacts to it there's been times in other sutras where he's preached a very specific teaching or a very important doctrine, and there's been thunder strikes, and there's animals all over the world have rejoiced, and you know mountains have split in two and stuff like that. And it's very interesting because the esoteric Buddhists will take this later, and they will kind of use that to argue that all of reality is Buddha, or else why would it kind of react to the things that he says and does? Huh. Okay, that's a cool idea. Yeah, I see where they're going with that. So so we get to the eight causes of earthquakes, and then this short section about the eight assemblies. This 
feels like a side note. I'm not exactly sure why this is here. So he says in Quartet 23, And I recall, Ananda, how I have attended each of these eight kinds of assemblies, amounting to hundreds. And they are nobles, Brahmins, householders, ascetics, the four great kings of the 33 gods, of Maras, and of Brahmas. So these are the different audiences of the Buddha. These are the different people who would talk to him and who he would talk to when he was traveling around preaching the Dharma. As for its purpose, for its inclusion here, I think that it is enumerating them for the reader more so than it is doing anything to advance the story or any sort of specific doctrine. However, I should point out that many of these classes, if not all of them, are noble classes. So there's a very interesting debate that gets a little bit heated sometimes going on in academia regarding whether or not Buddhism was a people's religion in its inception. So if you take it for granted that the Buddha actually lived and that he preached everything that we have written down and that his life was constituted after his enlightenment of decades of preaching and traveling, the question is, who did he preach to? And the question is, how did this differ from what the Brahmanical traditions were doing? Did he preach to low-born people in society? And Brahmanism, of course, then was reserved for nobility and for princes. Or did they both preach to nobility and princes and both preach to the low-born people? As you'll see, nobles, Brahmins, householders, ascetics, four great kings, 33 gods, Maras, and Brahmas, excluding the the divine ones, the 33 gods, the Maras, the Brahmas, there have been arguments that have been made that all of those other classes are only nobility, even householders and ascetics. It takes a lot of resources to be an ascetic, to be able to right. leave a household. If you are a first son, for example, you can't leave the household to be an ascetic because you have to inherit the family land and the family job and the family, you know, the household. And so if you're a second son, that kind of indicates that you have the resources to leave and that they can do without in the household. And of course, nobles and Brahmins are kind of, that's kind of like saying the same thing, right? I mean, nobles are going to be people who are in charge of a lot of land and Brahmins are going to be their spiritual advisors. They're going to be basically like politician priests, if you will. And then householders are going to be landowners, which is, you know, still a high class. And then ascetics, like we said, high class. And then great kings, gods, Maras and Brahmas, these all start to lean into the divine. And so there's an interesting dynamic here about who he's preaching to and who the Brahmanical tradition people who eventually evolve into the Hindu people are preaching to. I also note Maras, plural. That's an interesting thing. So there's more than one Mara? Yeah, that has always confused me as well. I think that Mara, the named singular Mara, is the god or the deity of desire and temptation and death and all of those things. And then Maras are kind of like a class of very strong demons who work for him, who are answering to the named Mara and who the named Mara will sick on the Buddha or on his disciples or anything like that. If we were to read the story of the life of the Buddha, as it's translated by several different people over a long time period, we would see that during the actual moment where the Buddha reaches enlightenment, there is a story about how the named singular Mara sends armies of demons and sends battalions of creatures and things to try and prevent the Buddha from reaching enlightenment. And so his defeat of Mara, his defeat of desire, is built up to be much more of a massive, insane feat. Because it's like a symbol, a symbolism going on, doing so involved him sitting still and meditating and sort of figuratively and literally defeating entire armies of Mara's creatures, Mara's subordinates. And so I think that those creatures and those subordinates are Mara's plural, if that makes sense. Okay, that makes sense. And so after that, we have the eight fields of mastery. What's going on here? This, these are like 
levels of understanding the re- reality, I guess. Yes, I think that the doctrine that is being presented here is the the idea of understanding something for what it is in true nature and what it what its true reality actually is. There's this concept that we have brought up here and there in Buddhism called suchness. In Sanskrit, it's tatata. And what it is referring to is the true nature of something, the true nature of something exactly as it is, not as we understand it or perceive it. So there is a gap. We've talked about how, especially in the Buddhist psychology episode, there's an idea about perception in Buddhism that starts with something that's pure and whole and complete and has all of the characteristics and information that one could possibly ever access in it. And then there is the file that our brains make about it. And that file is heavily compressed. It's got JPEG artifacts. It's got data loss. It's not complete. It's not accurate. It's not very faithful to the actual object itself. And this doctrine here is just saying, here are different ways to practice understanding things exactly as they are. And by doing so, we are working against our own delusion. We are shifting the base of our ignorance, ignorance being, according to the doctrine of dependent origination, the origin of all samsaric existence. We are shifting that ignorance all the way across to the other pole to understanding and to wisdom and insight. And these are some of the ways that they do that. Color becomes a big deal at the latter end of this. It starts as blue, then yellow, then red, then white. I imagine there's symbolism there that I'm just not keyed in to understand. I actually am not keyed in to understand why they pick those colors and not other colors either. But I do know that color presents an interesting problem for Buddhist perception and doctrine in general because... So I guess I should start from our current understanding of how color works. There's the entire electromagnetic spectrum, and then there is the visible spectrum within that spectrum. And the visible spectrum constitutes a very, very small portion of the, of the spectrum of different kinds of radiation that are emitted by things in, in the universe. So we know, because of science, that what is visible to us is only a very, very small portion of what's going on, and therefore we have maybe a healthy distrust for our naked eye. So that makes sense to us. Obviously, back then, they didn't have that. They didn't have the understanding that there were different kinds of radiation that were outside of what is perceivable by our actual eyeballs. And so this is where the issue of color comes in. We know that color is just specific wavelengths or combinations of wavelengths from that tiny visible spectrum. They couldn't figure out and argued about sometimes if color was an actual characteristic of something that was inherent to it, or if that was something that our consciousness applied to. Now, that's a very small and very specific question, but it's a very important question for understanding what reality looks like (laughs) and what reality actually is because of how we perceive it through our eyes. Can you trust your own senses? Exactly. And so we asked that same question about texture, about smell, about mental objects as well. And so this seems to settle that debate a little bit by saying that color is a characteristic that is kind of applied to objects by our consciousness because all of these other characteristics, such as something being small, beautiful, ugly, such as being large, such as being this color or that color, all of these different things, those, because they're grouped together like that, we can tell, okay, he's clearly grouping together color with relative perceptions, like large or small, with subjective perceptions, like beauty and ugliness. And so therefore, we can kind of infer he must be saying that color is sort of applied by our consciousness. Okay. So the colors are still kind of a mysterious, like, why is that there? Yes. And as for why there's a specific choice of those colors, in particular, blue, yellow, red, and white, I I can't really speak to why those and not others, but I can speak to the fact that color is included there to settle a little bit of a debate, which is that color is kind of applied by our consciousness. Right. 
Okay, so next are the eight liberations. This is this again is a list of stuff, and I'm not sure why it's here. So this is maybe a translation issue, or maybe not. Um, I'm not really qualified enough to say whether it's a translation issue because I I don't have the Sanskrit in front of me, and I don't know what Sanskrit they had in front of them. But my suspicion, based on this list is that these eight liberations are actually the eight jhanas. So jhana, as we've talked about before, is the word for meditation or concentration or wisdom. And you get through these eight jhanas through meditation. So there's the four rupa jhanas, which are the four form jhanas. They have form. They exist in the rupa datu, the realm of form, the, the form that we exist in, right? The fifth skanda the one that is the lowest level of the skandhas, the physical reality we live in. Those four then are sameness of one's own form and that of everything else, the breakdown of self and other distinction, joy, loveliness, pleasure, and intention toward that breakdown of distinction, and then the complete and total breakdown of categorical and discriminatory perception and sensation. This list is presented in other forms in different texts and in different doctrinal commentaries and things like that. But my suspicion from this translation is that this is what the Buddha is enumerating here. So we're familiar with the four regular jhanas. As I said, these are just sort of overcoming hindrances and being able to sit down and meditate. And then the first one is, you know, the feeling of sameness from one's own form and that of everything else. And then on and on it goes. The unfamiliar ones are the four arupa jhanas. Arupa jhanas are the formless jhanas, and they are the sphere of infinite space, sphere of infinite consciousness, sphere of nothingness, and sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. These are sort of like breaking down the different types of meditative states that a person can possibly be in, whether they're enlightened or whether they're not. If you're not enlightened, it's likely that you're bouncing around in the four jhanas. If you are enlightened, then you have sort of all eight available to you. And these liberations then are sort of, calling them liberations is kind of another way of saying you break into these jhanas, these meditative states, whenever you practice, whenever you master. And being that that's how this is presented, I think that the doctrine that it's trying to apply and the function that it's trying to play in the story is to try and get Ananda to remember these things and trying to get him to tell other people, like, this is what the Buddha says is important in his last few months of being alive. And these are the things that we ought to focus on. And these are the things we ought to practice. Ananda is known in the, te- in the doctrine for being the, the scribe of the Buddha. He keeps notes, yeah, we've so talked, to speak. Yeah. We've talked about Ananda before. Yeah, he is foremost in ability to memorize. And so giving him these lists is sort of showing him, okay, here's what I am thinking is important as I'm about to pass away. Okay. So this is there as a reminder and and an underline to say, like, this is important. Yeah. The jhanas are fundamental to a lot, a lot of Buddhism. I don't think that the jhanas are ever, by any sect that I'm aware of in East Asia, they're, I don't think they're ever denounced or rejected as being sort of the most refined doctrine of meditation ever given by Shakyamuni Buddha. Okay, and then after that we get Mara's former temptation, so rehashing what Mara said a while ago, and again, I'm not sure what this is doing here. I think that this is the Buddha trying to tell Ananda what happened. This is important because the Buddha is sort of explaining to Ananda, who also serves as an audience stand-in, this is what Mara did, and this is what I thought about it, and this is how I sort of got around it. And I'm telling you this because this all has to do with when I'm going to die. And I know that that's something that you, Ananda, are concerned about. So this is me telling you what happened. And I think that it's also a lot of build-up to Ananda's appeal, which comes after. Remember that the Buddha has voiced to Ananda that he's going to pass away. He's relinquished his will to live. And Ananda gets upset about it, and then they do something else for a while. 
the Buddha is sort of bringing it back up. And that sort of prompts Ananda to give his appeal, which comes right after that. Which we can roll into as the next topic. So Ananda is asking the Buddha to stay. And it ends with the Buddha comes off as kind of a jerk here to me when he's saying, well, Ananda, if you had asked me three times years ago when I was talking about this, I would have done it. But because you didn't, I'm going to die now. It's like, that's, I mean, Ananda is a highly realized monk and is also very devoted to his teacher. So he's going to go through with this just fine. But to me, like, if I had been there, that would have felt like the most passive-aggressive thing I'd ever heard. Yeah, so let's get in there, and do you remember what number was next to that one so I can read it out and then we can talk about it and why it's included? Uh, so, uh, I see it at number 55 and 56. So, in that case, let's see, the, the Buddha says, At Rajagriha, Ananda, when dwelling at Vulture's Peak, I spoke to you, saying... Pleasant Ananda is Rajagriha, Pleasant is Vulture's Peak. Whosoever Ananda has developed, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, the Tathagata could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. So, also at the Banyan Grove, at Robber's Cliff, at the Satapani Cave, on the Vebara Mountain, at the Black Rock of Isagili, at the Serpent's Pool, and all these other places. There's a long list of places. Yeah, he said this a lot. Exactly. And he says, I spoke to you in the same words, saying, Pleasant Ananda is this place. Whosoever Ananda has developed, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, the Tathagata could, if he so desired, remain throughout a world period or until the end of it. But you, Ananda, were unable to grasp the plain suggestion, the significant prompting given you by the Tathagata. And you did not entreat the Tathagata to remain. If you had done so, Ananda, twice the Tathagata might have declined. But the third time he would have consented. Therefore, Ananda, the fault is yours. Herein you have failed. Wow! What? Ah! That sounds so... That sounds... If if you were to put that kind of reaction into a romantic comedy, people would tell you that's hack writing. Yeah, exactly. This is... So in this very scene, he is blaming Ananda for his dying. His dying, of course, of like dysentery. Like he's got, he's got sort of chronic, like some sort of. It, it's clear in the text that you know they're not really emphasizing it, but dude's wrecked. Yes, his physical health is just not there, and he's basically saying to Ananda, "It's your fault that I'm kind of aging and dying." And so it's a very, it's a very important and good question. Why is this included here? This is sort of the exact opposite of what Ananda would have wanted to hear in that moment. It's not what would have made him feel better. It's not what would have made his fears of the Buddha dying go away. It's actually like pinning the entire thing on Ananda. And it's the, you know, he's saying, Hey, I could live forever if I chose to. And then is implying that's a clear prompting. Like again, if, this were written into a modern story and a character reacted like that. I cannot imagine a audience that's not going to turn on that character. Like exactly. this, this is the Buddha's being a jerk here. He's being circumspect about it. Like he's the, the way he's talking about, you know, this being a clear plain, you know, plain suggestion, the significant prompting, Maybe this is me and my autistic un un inability to pick up on social cues talking, but that sounds like such an unreasonable thing to expect from anyone to me. It is. No, I mean, this, this is entirely unrealistic and unreasonable for the Buddha to be expecting this from Ananda. And I think that building up to how insane it was for him to say this will help what he says next make a lot more sense and have a lot more impact. I think that this is one of those scenes that if we were to copy and paste this into a romantic comedy or any script that involves people interacting. Exactly. If we were to make it into like a television show or a movie or any kind of performance of, of some kind of theater, he's saying like, from this point of view, 
that you have, where if you ask me things three times, I consent and you get what you want. You didn't ask me three times. And so you failed by that principle. But then he says next, yet Ananda, have I not taught from the very beginning with all that is dear and beloved, there must be change, separation, and severance. Of that which is born, come into being, is compounded and subject to decay. How can one say, may it not come to dissolution? There can be no such state of things. So I think that the trope that we're looking at here is the Buddha saying, if I am to step into your world and how you think everything works, then all you would have had to do is ask me three times and I would have stayed. And you didn't do that, so you failed, according to your own unenlightened view of the world. However, I've been telling you from the start, the enlightened view of the world is that all things change, decay, sever, separate. So you can't implore things to not be that way. That is the way of reality. That's how the true nature of reality functions. And so for you to buck up against that just simply doesn't work. You can't do that. And so I think that it's building up to him saying, if you were to think that things were that simple, yes, you failed, but I'm trying to get you to not think that things are that simple because they're not. So I think that it's sort of a dramatic scene between him and Ananda. It's a lot of character building for the both of them. If we're to read this like a, like a story or a narrative or a screenplay or a script, they're having a kind of one of those moments where, you know, they're close to each other and they're being emotional at each other. That's how I imagine it in my head. They're not being emotional at each other because they're the Buddha and Ananda, but I can imagine it sort of as like a dramatic scene between two people who are close and who are going through this sort of situation where one of them is going to die soon and one of them is okay with it and one of them's not. Yeah, paragraph 58 in our translation, if that had been the thing he led with that would have made me less less negative in my reaction i guess because paragraph 58 makes sense to me impermanence is a fundamental thing that we've been over multiple times and yes i agree with the buddha that uh ananda's request is unreasonable uh but uh paragraph 55 and 56 just really i guess I've had to deal with people who have had not quite that absurd, but similar levels of failure to communicate, and I just really can't stand it. Yeah. So this is like, I'm reacting so negatively to this because I have real life experience that this is calling up that I just really wanted to get away from. So, yeah, I guess, I guess once in a while the teacher is harsh. I think it is a little bit of harshness, especially because Shakyamuni has this entire interaction has happened before in this sutra. Ananda keeps asking the Buddha to stay behind and to not pass away. And he's expressing a strong desire and attachment that is completely like perpendicular to the Dharma, to the teaching of the Buddha, to everything that Buddha has been trying to impress upon people since he's been enlightened. The section Ananda's appeal begins at what is labeled on our text, paragraph 48, where Ananda says, for I think like the second or third time in this text alone, please don't die. And right after that, in 49, the Buddha says, enough, Ananda, do not entreat the Tathagata. The time is past, Ananda, for such an entreaty. And Ananda just kind of stays on it and keeps at it. And the Buddha has to sort of, I don't know, slap some sense into him verbally in order to get him to quit, in order to get him to let go, because he asks this same question a second and a third time. And the Buddha has to say, you know, do you have faith in me? Do you even believe in anything that I'm teaching? Because you've clearly missed it so badly. You've clearly missed my doctrine of impermanence and of death and decay so badly that you're here asking me three times in a row in this specific setting, just like you did two chapters ago, to stay, to not die. But you know I can't do that. So why are you asking? You know what I mean? And so this is one of the more human moments for any of the Buddha's disciples. We don't see human moments like this where somebody is very sad like this and emotional like Ananda is, like we have to infer that Ananda is in any of the other texts. 
this is what makes this sutra so like fascinating and such a trip to read is because this is dealing with death. And if we take all of the doctrine away, this is sort of the scariest and most important thing that human beings face in their lifetime. This is sort of it. You know, anything in the entire world you can get through, but not death. And that's why we see the birth of religion. Religion is the answer to the question of how do I get through death? How do I deal with death? How do I make myself less afraid of death? And this sutra just gets so close to it and so deep into it that you see some uncharacteristically emotional and human moments between Shakyamuni and his disciples. And this continues through the entire rest of this part and through the rest of the last section with the last two chapters. It's a very, I don't know, a very fraught couple of sections. And you don't see that in a lot of other texts. Yeah, I need to, to have seen a lot of other texts to understand that at this point. I haven't seen enough of Ananda to understand that this was unusual. Ananda is usually, because he's like the attendant and the scribe and the guy who remembers everything, and who's also, he's also foremost in like manners and in like the procedures, the ways of doing things. If you didn't know that you're supposed to walk around the Buddha three times with your right side facing him before you talk to him, Ananda would be the one to tell you. And because he's that guy, he's kind of like the butler. He's kind of the guy that keeps the procedure and the manners and the culture, I guess you could say, up to a certain standard. It's very out of character for him to start getting emotional and start to get attached and start to get wrapped up in his own desire for the Buddha to keep living. Okay, that makes that section make more sense, for sure. So next we have the last admonition. This sort of sets up the last chapter, so I don't think that there's anything, unless you, like, skim through it another time and see there's something you want to talk about, there's probably just more of what's going to look into chapter four, the last meal. So let's move on to the last meal then so the elephant's look i'm glad that this translation has a footnote that explains what's going on here because just saying the elephants look like what is an elephant's look the translation is has a clarification that that means he turns his entire body to look instead of looking over his shoulder or whatever yes that's right and so he's kind of Going, hey, this is the last time I will look upon Vasali. So, like, making it clear that, like, hey, I'm almost done. Yeah, so he's made it clear to Ananda and sort of to capital N nature. And this is where he starts to tell the assembled disciples that the end is nigh. Yeah, so he bounces around a lot more places. So even though he is physically wrecked and having so much illness problems, he's still traveling a lot, it looks like. Yeah, he is. There's a part of that that is part of the ascetic lifestyle in that time period, in that place. Being a part of that class of society meant that you couldn't really stay places long because you were relying on the generosity of people who were trying to give offerings, who were trying to accrue the good karma that comes from hosting Shakyamuni Buddha, but there's like societal rules. For example, we hear about in like fantasy stories, you know, especially like Tolkien style, there are cultures that have like a an unspoken hospitality rule that anybody who just shows up at the door gets to stay there for three days with full food and drink and clothing because the environment is just that harsh, right? That's supposedly how things work in Greek mythology as well, as I recall. Exactly. And that's sort of an inviolable ritual that all of society participates in, regardless of anything, you know? And I think that there's a little bit of that going on here. He has to move around because he can't stay forever in any one place. There's like that logistical side, but there's also a doctrinal side. Physically non-abiding, you know, physically not abiding in one place for too long is the same as maybe spiritually or dharmically, if I could say something like that. Non-abiding. Don't get stuck in any one place for too long. Remain light. Don't be tied down by conceptions and by your thoughts and by 
emotions and by, you know, what eventually he argues are your delusions. So he kind of gets up and goes around as a certain baseline level. But now that he's dying, he's doing it at a, at a lot more of an increased rate. He knows that he won't be able to keep his physical body alive much longer. So he is trying to get as much teaching in as he can. And from there, we get to the four great references. And this was a big pile of repeated words that I had a hard time penetrating. Yes, I think that the essential doctrine that's being advanced here is the, the ability to sniff out a false teaching for once the Buddha is gone. Yeah, okay. So that's what they're really focusing on here is saying how to tell the difference between a genuine and not genuine teaching. Yeah, you have to be careful about who's saying it. You have to be careful about why they might be saying it. You have to be careful about what they're saying. And all of these things are sort of, these are like the steps that you would take in your evaluation of some dharma to actually understand, is this a true teaching or a false teaching? You have to be faithful to the community. You have to be faithful to the elders. You have to be faithful to the disciples that I'm leaving behind. And that's really the only way that you can know if something that somebody is saying is actually the Dharma. And then we get to the Buddha's last meal. Again, we have to go to a footnote. So the a quantity of Sukara Madhava, which the footnotes is not just staying straight up. We're not sure what this was. Yeah. So this is a very interesting scene that gets kind of zoomed in on by a lot of scholars and a lot of Buddhists alike. Because the translation of Sukara Madhava is completely lost to time, scholars think that there are two possible things that it could be. One possible thing is a mushroom dish, some sort of vegetarian mushroom thing. And the other side says that it's some sort of pork dish. And the reason why, aside from the obvious linguistic issues, the reason why we think those are the two most likely ones has to do with some of the differences that people can observe in Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism. So whenever you're dealing with Theravada in English in particular, they will argue that Sukara Madhava was a vegetarian dish and that Chunda gave him a vegetarian dish because he was realized in ahimsa or nonviolence. And so for him to have killed an animal and given it to the Buddha would have been not only tone deaf, but it would have been a cruel of bad karma. And the Mahayana side says that it was this pork dish. And the reason why they say that is because it doesn't matter what the dish is. The act of giving and receiving alms properly is much more important and has a lot more to do with this ascetic lifestyle, with the life of a bodhisattva, of a Buddha. There are no enlightened people out there who, according to Mahayana, would ever say, I'm sorry, I don't eat meat. You'll have to take this away. You'll have to take this back. You can't decline alms whenever you live entirely off of alms of the community. And so in that regard, they kind of differ on which one it is, emphasizing different doctrines, which are both very, very important for the monk's lifestyle. The almsgiving and the alms reception is very important for bodhisattvas and renunciants, right? And the ahimsa version is, the nonviolence version, is very, very important for practitioners of Buddhism in general. And so there's a lot of difference and a lot of contention as to what that could possibly be. But those are kind of the two main interpretations of that translation. And then after he eats, he orders uh, his host Kunda to bury the remainder because he could not find anyone who could eat it and entirely digest it except the Tathagata alone. That's right. So he knows for a fact that that meal is going to kill him but also it would kill others. And he's trying to sort of save the rest of the assembly to make sure that they don't get sick from, from this food. So the food, he, he knows the food is tainted, in other words, and he still eats it anyway. He does, yeah. And that is sort of the, that's him demonstrating the ritual 
necessity, so, so to speak, of graciously accepting alms and knowing also your own death and your own karmic trajectory, so to speak. So not only is he demonstrating in the most sort of striking way, like you actually do have to literally bite the bullet <laughs> whenever you are omniscient and enlightened and your time has come and you know your time has come this is not the times for cold feet you have to get into it you have to accept it and do it graciously and mindfully and then the other side of course too is that it sets him eating this and him preventing other people from eating this sets him up to later dispel chunda's remorse and to tell him that giving a tatagata his last meal is actually very meritorious and very good karma. So I think that because there's so many layers to the acceptance of the last meal, knowing that it's going to kill you, I think there's so many layers to that that inform all of the different interpretations of this scene as being skillful means and a teaching tool. He seems to be like going through all these little experiences and motions to set up a lesson. And because it happens so much and because the lessons are so subtle and so deep and so closely related to the experiences and the events, it's hard to say that he started preaching about them after, you know, after the event. It's hard to say the event made him think about this and then he said. Instead, it's more like he's doing all this on purpose so that he can tell us XYZ lesson. That is also, of, of course, informed by a sort of thematic and narrative reading of the sutras themselves but i think that there's a lot there that makes that argument really strong so this i think is building up to that all right and so next we get the clearing of the waters so water that had been churned up by cartwheels is miraculously made clean again compared to teleporting over the river this one does not feel like that big of a miracle to me yeah, that one's interesting. So this has to do, of course, with what the Buddha can do, who he is and how he does things and how powerful you might say he is. He sort of, if we go back to the interpretation of the Buddha as a physician and of the of sentient beings as the patient, this is another sort of skill of his in medicine, if that makes sense. It's a water into wine type of miracle. It's not like terribly useful and it's not extremely like divine and trippy in the sense that other things that happen in other sutras are, but it's definitely one of those powerful moments that feeds one of the interpretations of the Buddha in a divine way. And so then we get Pukusa the Mala. So that's the Mala clan. Uh, let me, I, again, I don't remember this section terribly well. In this section, the Buddha and Ananda, they meet this, or actually they don't meet this guy. They actually are thinking about this guy, this Pakusa of the Mala clan, and these 500 carts and these bad storms that passed by. My interpretation of this section, the Pakusa of the Mala section, and also the section in our translation called at the Kakuta River, all of this is sort of building up to an interpretation or a story or maybe a metaphor about the Buddha being incredibly sick, but weathering it mindfully so much so that he wouldn't even know that he was sick. So the idea about Pukusa the Mala is that he's able to not know that there had been storms and carts and chaos and loud noise right. and all that passing by. Okay, now that I needed that reminder. Now I remember what this was like. So this was, so Pukusa here is marveling at how deep the concentration goes for uh, a meditating monk right okay that's right i don't uh, so i apologize i think i interrupted you earlier but that uh like why is that important like why is that like this is a huge section of the text it is and i think that one of the reasons that it's included is that it's a metaphor for the the buddha enduring his illness with mindfulness and enduring it with grace and how everyone else should also do that. This Pakusa character is sort of, he's sort of a, maybe you could say like a symbolic character that the Buddha is trying to show to his disciples and to the readers of this text after the passing of the Buddha. 
you should be like him. You should endure my death, my illness, my passing, just like he endured 500 carts and bad storms. You should not even know that they really happened, right? And this is, of course, a little bit extreme. I think that the Buddha doesn't want people to forget he ever existed or to forget that he passed away. But I do think that he wants people to endure their great sufferings and the great passings away of anybody in their lives with this such mindfulness that it doesn't bother them. It doesn't wake them up in the sense like it doesn't make them upset. So I think that he's sort of like a, a symbolic character that he, that the Buddha is talking about for Ananda and for readers and disciples to understand how they should act after he passes away. And then after that, we are at the uh, Kakuta River where he is going to die? Not quite, actually. Not I think quite? that he goes to Kusinara or Kusinagara before he dies. This Pakusa of the Mala is important because he ends up going to the grove of the Malas, the Sala Grove at the Clan Mala Villa, you might say, or the Clan Mala Compound. So that's kind of why he's introduced here. But regardless, I think that you mentioned about him sort of teleporting across the river, and that's another symbolic sort of miracle. And then we come to the end of this section, which was relieving Kunda's remorse, which makes sense to me. If I were the person who fed this guy his last meal and he's like, oh, and by the way, don't let anyone else eat this because it's tainted, I would be concerned. You know, that that feels like it would be bad karma, even though it's accidental. So it's good of him to make it clear, no, this was okay, this was supposed to happen. Exactly, yeah. Chunda is a metal worker, so he's just kind of like a a common person. He's just a lay person. He's not really a devoted follower of the Buddha that's named in other sort of sutras and other contexts. He's introduced as like somebody who's outside of the ecumenical structure on purpose because you know he he ends up being one of the most important characters in the story of the Buddha's death, but other than that, he doesn't have anything to do with Buddhism. So to speak, you never see him in any other texts. And so we have to assume that he doesn't know that the Buddha is dying and that he's participating in the in the lesson that the Buddha is trying to sort of pass forth to the disciples and to the readers of the texts. He might be aware, he probably is aware of the fact that it's one of the five grave offenses to cause harm to a Buddha. That is one of the most grave sins that a person in Buddhism can commit, to actually cause bodily harm to a Buddha. And in fact, the Buddha's own cousin, Devadatta, does this in another text. And We've talked about Devadatta a bit, yeah. Yeah, and he's sort of regarded as like the most evil character in the Buddha's entourage because of this. And um, so he's thinking to himself, oh God, I've killed the Buddha. It's all over. I've committed one of the five grave sins and everything's yep. wrong. I would be very worried. Exactly. And the Buddha is good and right to say, no, you're actually participating in, you know, possibly one of the most important lessons of all Buddhism. And this is one of the greatest accruals of good merit that you could possibly have ever participated in because you gave selflessly. And then again, you are also concerned for the safety and wellness of who you gave to. And so this is a very good and human scene as well. There's not very many scenes as we'll see in other texts, where there's characters that are so upset, that are so emotional, as Ananda, as Chunda, as the Buddha's disciples after he passes away. There's not crying or wailing or calling out in other contexts. And in this one, there's a lot of that. And I think that it's really, really getting close to death as a reality for all of us, whether we are enlightened or not. Yeah, this has been interesting, and I'm very much looking forward to the final part of this. It's interesting to see the Buddha as more of a character rather than, like, this looming figure. Like, with this, and Ananda as well, uh, Here, having a more insight into how Ananda is thinking has also been really interesting. So yeah, this has been an interesting read. I'm glad. And I think that in the next section, it'll continue to build up and become more interesting. In the next section, we'll see, obviously, his passing away, but we'll also see how he tells that the council or how the disciples should function after him. Because 
in addition to obviously like the loss of the doctrine and the dharma and the person who conveyed it to them there's also sort of logistical things to think about okay the pope has died you know to use a, a metaphor or a, or a right. bad analogy from catholicism the pope has died what do we do now you have to pick somebody who's going to be in charge of the sangha after this you have to pick somebody who's going to sort of organize everything and everyone so that we know what to do <laughs> how to collect and organize the teachings how to perform rituals and manage rituals how to exist in northern india in the different states and political systems that we have to deal with how to exist in the same context as brahmanism which is highly critical of us at times you know there's a lot of logistical practical things that need to be dealt with and the buddha obviously in this next section he will give his advice and his admonitions for how those things should be carried out and we'll see from that all of east asian buddhist death rituals for the most part tend to be very close to if not identical to how the death ritual that he describes plays out in this section of the text anything else we need to talk about no i think that takes care of it all right well this has been good we'll see what happens next time i suppose let's wrap it up i guess thank you very much for listening this has been part two of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, including chapters three and four, and we hope to see you for part three, including chapters five and six. This has been a joy to read and discuss. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.